Good evening. You're watching The Digital Age, and I'm Jim Zirin. Tonight, we're on the campus of the Columbia University School of Journalism, and we have a very special program for you about the new media. The program is about bloggers on the internet, and the question is, are the bloggers journalists? Recently, the House of Representatives enacted a statute, a journalist shield law, which protected journalists from disclosure of their sources. The statute, by its terms, expressly excluded most bloggers. So the philosophical question confronting the House of Representatives was, are bloggers really journalists? And here to answer that question is someone who knows more about this subject than perhaps anyone else. There are 12 million bloggers in the United States. And our guest is Nicholas Lemon, reporter, writer, dean of the Columbia School of Journalism. Dean Lemon, welcome. Thank you. Now, uh, but I'm not a blogger. You're not a blogger. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, the, uh, we might start with uh, something perhaps uh, simplistic, and that is the definition of a journalist. You're the dean of a school of journalism. The dictionary says a journalist is someone who uh, writes or edits news for presentation uh, by the media, but doesn't say what kind of media. Uh, are journalists limited to any particular kind of media? No. You've raised a very difficult question. Uh, for benign reasons of freedom of the press, journalism is um, in this country and in most countries an unlicensed profession. Anybody who says he or she is a journalist essentially is a journalist. Um, so th there isn't, it, it's not like saying who is and isn't a lawyer because you as a lawyer have a piece of paper that says the state of New York has declared that I'm a lawyer. Um, we don't have that in journalism. So. Uh, if you think about a newspaper, a newspaper is kind of like a department store. A lot of different things go on under the roof of a newspaper, from comic strips to horoscopes to bridge columns to investigative reporting to editorial writing. So presumably all those people who do all those things are journalists in some way. Um, journalism operates through a number of media and the most open access medium ever really is the internet, uh, the newest one, um, the newest significant one for journalism. Well, so you've been dean here for about four years. Uh, have you had courses at Columbia Journalism School in the new media for the last oh, yes. four years? We, we started a new media department here pretty long ago, 1994. And uh, it, when I came here in 2003, it was during the internet bust, so we had almost no new media majors. Um, this year, we have something like 40 or 50 new media majors. So our new media department at the school is the fastest growing department. Um, and it's very popular. This year, for the first time, um, all students have to do web work in order to graduate. Um, all it, students? Yeah, all students. In addition to that, um, where we have three new, so we have this fall something like 20 new courses that do web work uh, just in one semester. We we're on a big ramp up because that seems to be the future of journalism. Well, someone uh, might apply to a, a school of journalism thinking that they, uh, which is a two year uh, course, as I understand one it. One year. One year course. We have two sequential one-year degree, so you can stay two years if you want to, but you don't have to. I see. But one uh, motivator for uh, applying would be that uh, I'd have a better career, I'd make more money. Uh, do bloggers uh, make money? Well, you shouldn't treat bloggers and new media journalists as the same thing. That's a, it's a very important distinction. Uh, there's a few bloggers who claim to be, or it is claimed on their behalf that they're making money, but if you want to use your 12 million figure, of those 12 million, the number who uh, would make a living at it would be maybe five. Um, <laughs> the chance of a blogger making a living as a blogger is infinitesimally small. Five bloggers out of the 12 million. I would, I mean, something like that, a tiny, tiny number. How do they make money? Uh, what they do is they, they can find various ways to 
if, if they can build up a big audience, they can find various ways to, as they say, monetize the audience, including charging a subscription price, affiliating with a large news organization site, and, and getting some kind of fee uh, for, for being hosted by that site and bringing their audience to the site. They can uh, link to advertisers and things like that. So there's, there's a number of ways to do it, but, but the point is, you know, we can safely say well under 1% of bloggers are, are, um, uh, are making a living at it. But let me go back to the other point because it, it's important. What we train people to do is a number of things in journalism, but the sort of classic job that somebody gets out of school here is as a daily newspaper reporter. So the reason we're making all these changes, or one reason is, <coughs> excuse me, when you get that job, you are now finding that you're working for the website of the newspaper um, as much as, or in many cases more than, you're working for the print edition. And the, the audience for newspapers has shifted way over to the web. Um, so there's a genre of web journalist who isn't a blogger. Most of our students, certainly a plurality if not a majority, after six months after graduation are going to be working a lot on the web, but they're not going to be bloggers. Uh, now, uh, the leading professions uh, one could think of, uh, law, medicine, accounting, have a code of ethics, standards, which uh, apply and are binding, applied to and are binding on members of the profession. Now, journalists have a code of ethics, do they not? We actually don't have a code of ethics. That's an interesting question. We teach ethics. We require it of all of our students. But there is, because there is no licensing procedure, um, there is no overarching code of ethics for journalism. Instead, there's about 15 different competing codes of ethics. Uh, there's a lot of overlap among them, but there is no single code of ethics that you have to sort of pledge allegiance to to join the profession. Many news organizations have internal ethical codes. Most of the really good ones do, but each one has its own. Um, the, the Society of Professional Journalists, which is a professional society, has its own, but there isn't any overarching code of ethics for but all But there journalism. are generally accepted standards. I mean, there's yes. a standard that a journalist should try to be accurate. There's yeah. a, a standard that a journalist should try to use sources that are reliable, yeah. that the journalist shouldn't have a conflict of interest, and on right. and on and on. Uh, do, and you teach those standards uh, in, the, in the journalism school, and I suppose if I went to work for a newspaper, or even one that didn't have an internal code of ethics, if I breached one of the uh, generally accepted standards, I'd be out on my ear. Uh, and uh, that was what uh, most members of the profession would expect. Mm -hmm. uh, do those standards apply to bloggers on the internet? Well, first of all, there's no way to apply standards to bloggers. In other words, a graduate, of, esteemed graduate of this school, A.J. Liebling, once said, freedom of the press is available only to those who own one. That is not true anymore. Uh, the, the great thing about the internet is it has lowered the barrier of, to entry to be quote-unquote in the press to zero. You and I can go home after this and be international publishers in about half an hour just by going on you know, blogger software on Google, starting a blog, and so on. So there's no policing mechanism for bloggers. The way to think about blogging, I think, as, as a sort of subspecies of journalism and a subspecies of internet journalism is um, to think about the familiar distinction between news and opinion. It's not perfect, but it, it'll do for our purposes. Um, most blogging is opinion journalism, not news gathering. Most bloggers are working from home or working from a sort of stationary location. They don't go out in the field very much. Some of them say they're doing reporting by virtue of searching the internet, but it, it's, it's mostly done by the way columnists work. They sit in an office and they ingest what's going on in the world and they offer their own take on it. So the ethics stuff mostly applies to the, the active social function of being a reporter and going out and interviewing people all day. And since bloggers aren't doing that, um, you know, a lot of the ethical conversation doesn't apply because besides getting it right, a lot of it has to do with when you ask somebody for an interview, 
how do you represent yourself? What does on the record and off the record mean? Um, are you allowed to have any kind of financial relationship with people you're interviewing? But since the huge majority of bloggers aren't going out and interviewing people, then they're sort of independent opinion meisters. It, it's a sort of separate world from the world of professional journalism and its various... Well, is that clients. entirely true? You do have uh, blogs, as you said, that are attached to what traditional uh, media uh, organizations. Yeah. I mean, Forbes.com yeah, has right. a blog. And the New York Times and, has uh, blogs. And the New York and the Times has, has blogs. And uh, so uh, it's, it certainly occurs that a reporter for the New York Times could interview yeah. someone it doesn't appear in the uh, in the print version, but it appears online. So, so, so what happens in that case? Most news organizations that run their own blogs, they basically they struggle with this a little bit, but they find ways to pull their own bloggers under the umbrella of their own in-house ethical codes. Uh, so that's sort of not a problem. It, there are a few problems that come up in, in that connection, which I can go into if you want, but. The real issue is the huge, huge, huge majority of bloggers are people just sitting at home and opining about something on the internet, often on a purely local matter. And there's no way to have any kind of licensing, membership, policing mechanism. It's just, it's, it's like Hyde Park Corner. It's total free expression. It's a bunch of people with soapboxes. Well, uh, we have different kinds of blogs, don't we? I mean, we have the blog newspaper, like the uh, New York Times that has, or uh, Forbes that we mentioned, uh, you might have the Huffington Post, yeah. uh, which uh, is, has a, uh, a blog component, and that's kind of an online newspaper. Then you have uh, bloggers, as you said, who are uh, uh, opinion givers, uh, pundits, if you will, and there's a popular blog called, uh, with which I think you're familiar, called instapundit.com. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I don't know whether everyone comes on to Instapundit. I guess they can, and uh, they can express an opinion about practically anything. Uh, but there are other kinds of blogs. There are, uh, for example, aggregation sites. Yeah, those are, uh, I would not call those blogs. I would call them aggregators. Those are, for those who don't know, who may be watching, those are people who set up a website and pull other things under a categorical heading and, and link to them through the site. So if, for instance, you're interested in arts and culture, there's a wonderful site called Arts and Letters Daily, and you can log on, and they'll have essentially all the significant arts coverage in the English language that day in one place. All of us journalists log on to a site called Romanesco, first thing in the morning, and that aggregates everything that's been written about journalism that day. Um, but those people are not... Well, Drudge is a slightly, is a sort of hybrid um, of a number of things, and he has by far the biggest audience of any of the bloggers, if he is a blogger. Um, he's the only per sort of solo operator who's competing with big news organizations in terms of, of audience size. Uh, but, but the aggregator sites, I, I don't know Jim Romanesco's opinion on anything. He just never speaks in his own voice. He merely gathers material together in one place. So it's a very different, well, it's almost like Reader's Digest or something. But they do tend to make a case through the aggregation. I mean, for example, we have a site uh, that uh, lawyers look at called overlawyered.com. Yeah. And that's an aggregator. Yep. But it's making the case that there are too many frivolous lawsuits and we need reform. Yeah, so there's uh, a lot of ways to do it. Romanesco, I truly don't know his opinion on anything. He's very even-handed. He just gives you everything about journalism. Ditto Arts and Letters Daily. I agree about over lawyered and, 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 and then there's these hybrids where, um, you know, like balkanization, if you ever read that, a legal site where, where somebody presents his own take on things and links to other things that generally tend to agree with his take on things. Now, uh, the traditional mainstream press, of course, has been criticized and criticized and criticized for being inaccurate. Mm -hmm. Many people think the New York Times can't run an accurate story, you can't, can't believe what you read in the newspaper, or for being corrupt, uh, or for not telling, or for shading their stories, being biased. Uh, so we do have watchdog blogs, don't we, that are kind of watchdogs on the uh, conventional, traditional 
uh, journalism. Yes, one of which we run here at Columbia Journalism right. School, Columbia Journalism Review, which, you know, when I came in as dean, um, was a magazine with a website that was kind of like a brochure for a magazine. And now we publish every day in blog form on CJR Daily, um, CJR.org. And so we do that here, and, and a number of other people do as well. Many ideologically inclined sites do media criticism designed to catch the media in making a mistake against their side, such as Media Matters, um, Power Line on the right, and so on. Frank Rich had a, an op-ed piece uh, recently, uh, you probably saw it, in which uh, he talked about uh, the possibility of Judith Regan bringing down Giuliani. Uh, and he referred to her suit uh, against uh, Harper Collins and one particular allegation in the suit that a senior executive of Harper Collins told her uh, not to reveal to the grand jury information affecting Bernard Carrick, which would be damaging if revealed to the Giuliani campaign. And then he went on to say that uh, this allegation was not mentioned in the report of the suit in the Wall Street Journal. It was omitted, and bloggers had uh, brought this to the attention of the Wall Street Journal, and then they added it yeah. to uh, their story of uh, the suit, lawsuit, which appeared in their online uh, version. So that's an example of bloggers serving a kind of watchdog function. Yeah, no, there's, there, there, it doesn't happen every day, but it definitely happens. Another famous case is the business of Dan Rather and, and 60 Minutes 2 in the fall of 2004, the piece about Bush's National Guard service, where within seconds of its appearing on the air, uh, the blogosphere was calling the documents shown in that piece uh, uh, false, and that ended up bringing down Dan Rather himself, eventually. So they, they have these moments. One of the things they can do is fact check. Another thing they can do is get into what political scientists call agenda control. In other words, they can say, hey, mainstream media, you're treating this as a small thing, but it's actually a big thing. Trent Lott's comments about at Strom Thurmond's 100th birthday party, if you remember that, um, that was a public event. It was reported in the press no big deal, and the blogosphere started beating the drums and saying, that, you know, look what he said, and it became a big story. They forced the media to pay attention. U.S. Attorneys uh, is another case where the, the, the blogosphere sort of picked up on it and demanded that the mainstream media pay more attention. This is the and, firing of the U.S. Yeah, attorneys and they got listened, Gonzalez, yeah. yeah, and they got listened to. So when they have a case, it's a healthy thing for democracy and for the press. When they have a case, it gets listened to, but if you look at the blogosphere, every single day, one category of bloggers is saying the press isn't paying enough attention to this or that or the other. So every so often it works, usually it doesn't work. So blogs uh, that might serve this watchdog function are blogs like hotline.com or uh, talking points. Talking points memo. Memo.com, mm -hmm. uh, blogs of that sort. Uh, but what kinds of people uh, are sitting there at home? Do they have a day job who uh, are trying to be watchdogs over the mainstream media and see if the Wall Street Journal got it right? Well, they, uh, this, I mean, in, in the cases you've just mentioned, this is their day job. And, and some of these are, are now pretty substantial operations. Some of them <clears throat> have, are getting money, including Columbia Journalism Review, from foundations. So they have full-time employees. Uh, some of them make a little money on advertising and subscriptions and such. Um, but, you know, it, it is a full-time job for the more substantial ones. Media Matters has a full-time staff. Um, and, and then, of course, you know, anybody who wants to just operate a blog out of a den in the basement at home is free to do so. So some blogs post very sporadically. Some blogs have staffs and post constantly with no ethical requirement that they uh, use reliable sources or that they uh, get it right. Or, uh, I mean, I could go on a blog and say uh, everything that appeared in the New York Times this morning is false. Right. That's, um, you know, it, it's very hard to police that um, given the extremely large number of blogs. And it, it sort of settles itself out in the sense that um, you know, if you're flagrantly inaccurate, uh, presumably your audience would leave you. 
But I'm not aware of anybody even having uh, successfully sued a blog for libel or defamation yet. It's, it's all very new. Um, they might not have enough money to make the lawsuit worthwhile. Yeah, but, but yeah. The, well, it wouldn't be. It would just mm -hmm. be for a sort of moral victory. But I, I, um, there is no real policing mechanism. Now, if you want to put an optimistic spin on this, people get very worried about it. But, you know, if you look at the, the websites that are sort of journalistic, arguably journalistic, that have very big audiences, they tend to be the big, famous professional news organizations that aren't perfect, but they really do try to get it right, and they do have ethical codes. In the top, you know, 20 or so, uh, the only one that's a sort of lone wolf is Drudge, and the rest are fairly familiar names, New York Times, CNN, the big television networks, and, and, and so on. So um, I, I don't think we've seen the scenario of somebody just hurling completely irresponsible and untrue charges and developing a huge audience that can't distinguish that from the real thing. So they won't survive in the marketplace of ideas? It's more complicated. I mean, there's the marketplace. I don't think they will survive in the marketplace of ideas, although they always could. Um, nobody's surviving in the economic marketplace on the Internet, so that, that's a whole other set of questions, is what supports the Internet. And, and it is generally true of the blogosphere that it sets the bar somewhat lower on printing rumors than the mainstream media uh, do. My friend Mickey Kaus is a blogger called Kaus Files, which is on Slate, and he this week has had a, a couple of occasions where he says, I would like to defend the proposition that the press can publish rumors that are unsubstantiated by presidential candidates and he is linked to all over the blogosphere. So there's a kind of ideology behind printing rumors, and that is the mainstream media know this, these things, and they're suppressing it because they think the citizens shouldn't be trusted with these rumors. We trust the people, so we publish the rumors. Let's turn to another kind of blog, uh, which we might call the citizen blog, uh, which is quite different from what we've been discussing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know you're from New Orleans, and uh, during Hurricane Katrina, the newspaper, the Times-Picayune, was out of business. Its plant was flooded, I guess. And, uh, but they did have a web component. I think it's called a n a NOLA.com. NOLA.com. And they performed a different kind of uh, function from the types of blogs we've been describing, didn't they? Yeah, well, let's talk about categories here. So, you know, and the categories are all squishy and they're all being defined and so on. So there's a category called citizen journalism. And that is, you set up a website and you essentially say, anyone can contribute material to this website on a particular topic. Um, and it's just kind of open mic, send in your stuff and it will be published without any kind of filtration or editing. Um, many professional news organizations have created regions within their own websites for citizen journalism, such as NOLA.com, and there's many others. So in that way, you have a big site, and even the New York Times does this a little bit, and, and it's mostly sort of professional journalism, and it looks and feels like a newspaper. And then as you make your way around it, there'll be a region where readers can just sort of send stuff in, um, and it appears. Then there are sites that are all citizen journalism, and the, the ideology is much more hostile to the mainstream media, and they say, anybody who wants to send material in can send it in. It will not be filtered or edited in any way, and that is our entire content. No gatekeeper. No gatekeeper. No editor would... Gatekeeper a, is a very dirty word pen. in the citizen journalism universe. With a deli. Yeah. Uh, let, uh, let me ask you this. You've uh, written in The New Yorker, I guess, that on the Internet, everyone is a millenarian. Yeah. What do you mean by that? You know, if you study the history of the media, which we teach here and we're trying to teach more and more and more, um, you will find that, seems like stating the obvious, there has been for three, four hundred years a whole series of transformative new communications technologies. And when one comes along, all sorts of economic, political, cultural things change. The Internet is a, the latest. It's a very dramatically powerful one. 
and uh, many people associated with it professionally tend to say, this is the one that really matters. Nothing will ever be the same again. It will utterly change everything. It will sweep everything before it. So one of the challenges for people trying to understand the internet, and put it in context, is to figure out how true that is, because you get a very maximal claim from internet people about the internet. Um, and, and, and that's what I mean by the reference to millenarianism. Yep. It's uh, uh, the new millennium has begun and you know, politics will change utterly, economics will change utterly, the national borders will change. I, I don't know, I think you have to sort of discount some of that stuff. If you were old enough to remember when TV was new, a lot of these claims were made about television. All other media will die. Uh, television will sweep everything before it. It will change the way we live. And it happened up to a point, but not totally. Uh, now, you have uh, written for the Washington Post and for the New Yorker, and you've written at least four critically acclaimed uh, books. Uh, you didn't go to journalism school, did you? No, I didn't. And uh, is it necessary to go to journalism school to it's, be a, a journalist or a blogger? No. Uh, w the question to ask about us is, does it add value to the individual who elects to go here? Because, as I mentioned, we're an unlicensed profession. Nobody has to go to journalism school. Probably the hiring pattern in journalism is, is moving somewhat in the direction of preferring a journalism degree to no degree compared to when I was starting out. Um, but it's not an absolute requirement in any way. So if you go down you know, the masthead of the New York Times, you'll find a mix of some people with a journalism degree and some people who don't have a journalism degree. Um, for I the hate to cut you off, but we, we have to wrap up. But it's time for our question, and the, the question has been really marvelous. But the question is, are bloggers really journalists? I think uh, it, it, it's hard to answer that and you can get trapped easily. I would say they're real opinion journalists, most of them. They are, most of them are not real repertorial journalists. That's a meaningful distinction to me. Nick Lemon, thank you for coming by. Thank you. And thank you for coming by. Uh, tune in next week for more on the digital age. For the digital age, I am Jim Zirin. Thank you and all the best.